Welcome to this oral history interview, part of the developing series of interviews focusing on live music venues and experiences on Route 66, centered around Springfield and Greene County, Missouri, and Lebanon and Pul Pulaski County, Missouri. This series is supported in part by a grant from the Route 66 Corridor Preservation Program of the National Park Service. My name is Craig Amison with Missouri State University Libraries. Today's date is September 23rd, 2022, and our special guest today is John Sellers, Executive Director Emeritus of the History Museum on the Square here in lovely downtown Springfield, Missouri. Mr. Sellers was the Executive Director of the museum from 2005 to 2022, but his connection with the museum goes all the way back to 1976 when he served as a volunteer. He took the director position at the museum after retiring from a career in marketing in the beverage industry, which I'm guessing brought him into contact with owners and managers of entertainment venues in the area. John, we are pleased to have, your, uh, have you to participate in this project, and thank you for agreeing to help us. Happy to help. Um, have you lived your whole life in Springfield? Well, I grew up in Springfield. Uh -huh. uh, Right on Route 66. As a matter of fact, okay. I grew up on St. Louis Street. Okay. And uh, grew up here, and then moved away with my work, and traveled all over the country, and then came back uh, right after 2000. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you one one question before we get into specific venues. If you had to use one word to describe the live music scene, what it was like in Springfield before 1985, what what would that word be? Extraordinary. Good. Yeah. Um, better than other places, you think? Better than other places, more varied, more uh, uh, musically uh, innovative mm -hmm. than, than a lot of places. We have, we have had, uh, over the course of time, some of the most uh, amazing musicians that have come from here. Bebop Brown, people like that. Uh, later on, Granny's Bathwater. Uh, uh, and wonderful bands and, and people that we lost way too young. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about some of the specific venues and, and uh, just to, as a disclaimer, we have talked to you before about these, uh, right. these venues, so we're sort of coming back to you with some that you mentioned specifically that you had personal knowledge of, so I want to sort of, sort of run through a list of places and just give us your impressions, sure. thinking in terms of... Um, like, if you will, for each of these, just sort of keep in the back of your mind what the venues looked like inside mm -hmm. and out, um, any of the people who worked there, the owners that you right. knew, um, you know, how often were they open, how late they were open, you know, those kind of things. And the audiences, too. Sure. As far as gender, race, mm -hmm. age, all that sort of thing. Right. Um, so the first one would be the Alibi Lounge at Cherry and Glenstone. Ah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Tell us what you remember. That, about that's the one of my favorites. Yeah, had them. For me, it was um, it was very upscale. Had a big horseshoe shaped bar that was well lit, and then dark around the edges. Uh, Teresa Spain and the Little People were the kind of the house band there, mm -hmm. and uh, she was uh, she sang a lot of uh, uh, Tina Turner uh, things like that. She had a great band backing her up. Uh -huh. And uh, it was a place to go have a nice quiet drink and, and enjoy yourself. What it time period a, do you remember? It wasn't a big rowdy bar. Uh -huh. uh, oh, um, late 60s, early 70s, on the okay. way up, uh, say, the mid, mid 70s. Yeah. What, yeah. what kind of audiences were there? Uh, working people, uh, you know, just nice. Uh, wasn't a lot of college kids. Okay. Mostly working working people. Uh, uh, young uh, folks? Uh, fairly young, yeah. 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 Um, equal male and female? Pretty much. Pretty much? Yeah. Um, any races other than white? No. Represented? No. Okay. Um, any, any particular incident or special memory you have of that place? Is there anything jump out at Nothing you? Nothing really jumps out other than the fact that it was just a pleasant place to go have a drink. It uh -huh. was, it was, there wasn't, uh, you didn't have to worry and, and have your head on a swivel worried that there was going to be a fight break out behind you and you're going to get clunked to the beer bottle or something. High class place. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, was it open? Uh, Regular how, hours. Open to one thirty. And how many nights a week do you think? Six, I think. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and would you say that 
people went there for the music, or were they going there just because it was a nice place to get a drink? I think both. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to come back uh, with all of these in mind, uh, thinking about why it was important to be on mm -hmm. Route 66, too. So sort of be thinking right. about that, too. Mm -hmm. um, Shep's Sunset Inn. <laughs> a little different. <laughs> <laughs> Do tell. Uh, Shep's Sunset Inn was a, it, it had its own little cadre of, of people. It had its own customers. The thing I remember most about Shep's, it was just a neighborhood bar out there on the West End. But Shep's uh, was in a rough and tumble place and they sold a lot of long neck beer. So they had a big area, a storage area of, of bottled beer stacked up, cases of bottled beer. And to protect that area and to keep people out of it, they had a dog. And the dog's name was Seaberg, like the, like the jukebox. Uh -huh. And Seaberg scared me and everybody else to death. It was kept on a huge log chain with a big pinch collar. And it, when it saw you, it came for you. It knew it wasn't going to get to you because that log chain was going to stop it. But it made every effort to stretch that chain far enough to get to you. So you knew exactly where you could walk <laughs> to stay out of reach of Seaberg. So it was, uh, that was, that was the, the, my, my memory of, of Ship Sunset Inn. What, tell us, do you know exactly where it was? It was out near the Sunset Drive-In. Okay. And so that's kind of, you know, out on the West End, lots of truck drivers. Uh, that was out past the bypass. So okay. the truck drivers that would come across Kearney Street, which was the drive around for Route 66, and down the bypass and on out 66, would have come by there. Uh, and there's truck stops out there, places to have their trucks work on, and they could stop and wander in ships. And, and that was a lot of their clientele? Oh, yeah. Truckers? Yeah. So that would have been a very different audience. Yeah, yeah. Rough, and and rough and tumble. Mm -hmm. Mostly men? Yeah, mostly men, mostly jukebox playing loud mm -hmm. uh, yeah I don't they had live music but it was uh, yeah it was it was a different different band. but they did have loud music from time oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. And, any any yeah anybody specifically you remember not that I remember okay. but I didn't go there a lot <laughs> 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 yeah. You delivered there? Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. So that's how you knew yeah. primarily as opposed to yeah. To, yeah. To be I went there as the, as the beer guy and so uh -huh. that's why I knew where the dog went to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um Tinkle Bar on St. Louis Street Tinkle 506. Bar. Uh Tinkle Bar was an interesting place because it was right next to the bus depot. Mhm. Mm and so at that time we had a lot of military, you know, back in the day, but a lot of military getting riding bus from down from Fort Leonard Wood on leave. They'd come to Springfield, come to the big city. Yep. And uh, so the Tinkle was their first stop to kind of get themselves lubricated to move on from there. <laughs> so it was, uh, it, it was, uh, yeah. So um, that might have had as many out of towners as it had local. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. Um, racial mix, always white, or uh, you, do you remember ever seeing anybody? No, in I, yeah, maybe a few. Uh huh. But yeah. Yeah. Um, what kind of music? Mm, kind of middle of the road, and not not anything significant that I even remember about. Just pop. Mostly just Mostly current pop. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Um, open most nights of the week. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how was how was the crowd capacity um, at a place like Tinkle Bar compared to Alibi? Mm, there were fewer people, but it seemed more full. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Esquire Lounge, North uh, Jefferson. <laughs> the Esquire Lounge was up above the Crown Drug Store. You had to go up a side door and in a flight of, up a flight of stairs. Halfway up was a landing, and then the rest of the way up to the to the. Uh, to the bar. I got knocked down that flight of stairs one night, or at least halfway down it. I made it to the landing, and I was on my way up to the Esquire. Made it to the landing, and just as I got to the landing and turned to head the, for the finish line, uh, the owner uh, came out the door with a guy by the shirt collar in the back of his pants and threw him down the stairs. 
and hit me with the guy and knocked me back down the stairs. Like so I broke his fall. I, yeah, I broke his fall. And then uh, he looks down and sees me and goes, sorry, man, and just goes back in the bar. He went back into and the bar. And he went back into the bar. Just, you know, he trossed the guy. He does what he needed to do, and he just... He made a statement. Yes, he had, and I was part of that. So I did get a free beer when I got back to the top. Uh, but yeah, it was like, sorry, man, and just back inside. Was the owner Ray Rutledge? Yeah, Ray at Rutledge. That time? Yeah. And uh, also owned Raymond. Ramon. Ray yeah. Ramon's on yeah. West Sunshine. Yeah. Where on North Jefferson, uh, that's why you. you Crown, uh, the Crown Drug was on the very corner of Jefferson St. Louis. Okay. Jefferson. And you had to go around on the Jefferson Street side and up to okay. get into it. Okay. And the clientele there? Uh, all over the board. Uh, a right. lot of working people, a few college people, uh, mostly locals. Yep. Yeah. And uh, the kind of music? Uh, rock and roll mainly. Bands? Some country western. They've had a band now and again, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. So that sounds kind of eclectic. Like, yeah, oh, very. Yeah. 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 It was one of one of my favorite places to go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what did it look like inside? Just big and open and rough. Okay. Yeah. Not a lot of... Not fancy. Not a lot of decor. <laughs> <laughs> Not a theme. <laughs> Okay, what about um, Duck's Tavern, West Town? Uh, uh, excuse me, Duchess. Duchess Tavern. Duchess excuse Tavern. Uh, that's interesting because right now they're building a uh, huge uh, convenience store at that location. That's out there where Bucky's is going to be. Oh, seriously? Yeah, Duchess uh, Tavern. Duchess was just a little local place that people would stop into and, and uh, uh, have a cold one on their way home. I mean, it wasn't, there wasn't much to it. Dutch was a neat old guy. But he just, you know, it was just he was open for the convenience of people nearby. What was his full name? I don't know. Okay. We always call him Dutch. Yeah, the owner. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, live music there at all? Not that I ever remember. Okay, just like jukebox, jukebox kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. What was the time period on that? Oh goodness, Dutch's was there from the, I think the '40s, early '50s on up, till late into the '60s. Okay. Yeah. There's a couple of similar named rest yeah. lounges, yeah. so I wanted to make sure we had the right yeah. one. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, Tony's Mayfair Cocktail Lounge at 413 St. Louis yeah. Street. That was in the uh, in the uh, downtowner hotel, or the Moran. Before that was the name of it. It was a hotel, just a hotel lounge. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Kind of cross the street in the same block as the bus depot and the Tinkle. Uh huh. Yeah, so, roughly same time period. Yeah, yeah, that? but more of a traveling salesman kind of a bar. People really? you know staying at the hotel, come in there. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the Mayfair and the Rendezvous were kind of similar type places. Did, one was in the Colonial, one was in the in the Downtowner. They have any live music ever? Uh, Did you remember? Not that I remember. Mm -hmm. um, was it a pretty nice place on the inside? Yeah, it was nicer. Yeah, yeah. Kind of more quiet. Right. Yeah, so you could have a conversation, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, uh, you knew we were going to ask Kentwood Arms. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Because we we've, we've talked to some other people about the Kentwood Arms. Yeah, Kentwood Arms was a, uh, we had a movers and shakers kind of bar. Mm -hmm. People, you know, a little more upscale in the community would go into the to Kentwood for a drink after work or whatever. And what was the so name? C. Arch Bay owned the building, so he was the postmaster, and so there was a lot of political things and stuff. And for the record, what was the name of the lounge in the Kentwood Arms? It was called the uh, Fox and Hounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've, we've heard that it could get rowdy in there from time to time. Time to time, uh -huh. yeah. But not not as as uh, overtly rowdy uh -huh. as some places. And uh, served as a jazz club quite a bit. Right, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you remember hearing any any live music in there? I think the uh, Bedells played in there. Uh -oh. uh, that you know that genre of music was was pretty strong in there. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of jazz. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, business people. Yeah. That was that was my, my pretty much yeah. yeah. Mainly people traveling through, staying at the hotel, mm -hmm. and then local business people. Okay, so you had a mix. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, um, we're speeding through. Bebop's. Bebop's. I want to talk about What Bebop's. a great place. Yeah. Uh, Bebop Brown. Yeah. Greatest saxophone player you ever heard. Of course. And uh, 
He, it was right there off Jones Alley, and uh, it was uh, it was it was a place. It was it was where it happened. That and his other club out north of town at the Idlewild. But uh, uh, it, everybody that was anybody wanted to play at Bebop's. Did he have two clubs running at the same time? Mm, for a short period of time, but yeah. Which one was first? Do you remember? Well, Bebop's one. Bebop's Lounge yeah, yeah. Was, was first, yeah. and then and then the one out. Yeah, on, out on north. Sixty six. Yeah. Okay. Um, tell me your memories of of that place. Anything that uh, stands out in your mind? Uh, very little, because it was it was in an era before I was. You know, making those places. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it had already run its course by the time I was. Okay. Uh, you know, at work in that kind of business or whatever. Right. So it had come and gone. Did it? But it, did was, it? But it was. A, it was always a fascinating place to me, just because I ran in that area. That was my neighborhood. That was where I grew up. So, uh, just in traveling by and hearing stories, it was. Would you say that Bebop? Bebop Brown was probably one of the most famous owners, club owners, in Springfield. As far as uh, as far as African American, he mm -hmm. was the most famous mm -hmm. by far. Yeah, yeah, by far. And and so you know, along with the ships and the, and the Bedells and all those people, they were they were so heavily involved in music of all genres that uh, their contribution can't be can't be oversold. It right. was just tremendous. Yeah. Um, the clientele at Bebop's, largely African American. Oh yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh-huh. Um, any other African American clubs that, you, that come to mind? I'm, no. I'm curious about that. So Bebop sort of had the corner on that Pretty market, much, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and do you remember specific groups that came in there to play? Did he bring in African American groups on the outside, or do you know? I think to some extent he did, but I don't know. I'm not sure who. Okay. Yeah, like I said, that's kind of before my era. Were the Philharmonics? Played? Oh, I'm sure they would sing there. Sing yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, anything I'm not asking that I should, Tracy? Well, I may jump to the Ritz. Okay. So the Ritz was. That was on my. That was next. On okay. My that's what I was, yeah. Yeah. It was more of a location for parties to rent out. Right. It was. It was like it. The Ritz was like the West End. Uh, Half Hill Club. Okay. Yeah, I mean yeah. they're just so similar. It was a place where you rented to have a party. There would be bands in there on weekends when there wasn't a party, and it, you know, it, Speedy Hallworth always played at at, uh, at Half Hill, and then uh, I can't remember what the guy's name was. It had a band that played open nights at the Ritz. God, what was his name? I may have a clipping on it. Shoot, uh, but anyway, that was a very similar type of. Uh, Type of facility where it was it was available to rent. If you didn't rent it, they they'd have just an open night. Okay. Because it was they were bottle clubs. They weren't they didn't have a liquor mm -hmm. license. Uh -huh. So there they they say you they'd say you set up and yeah. then you bring your own bottle. And half hills down on battle. Right. Yep. Yeah. Right. But African Americans generally could rent the Reds. From yeah. what I'm understanding. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I, I I think I'd ask you any other African American clubs that you can mm -hmm. think of. No. The, Bebop's really was about it. Bebop's right? was about yeah. it. Um, let's see. Talk to us. I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to leave here without talking about the Shrine Mosque. No. Um, so, personal knowledge. Separate for us between your personal mm -hmm. knowledge of the Shrine and what you know about the Shrine historically. Uh, the Shrine was always uh, uh, just an amazing place. Mm -hmm. There was always something going on. There was either music or wrestling or boxing. Or goodness knows what, but there was always something happening at Shrine Mosque. It was the center uh, in those days before all the places we have now. It was the center of activity, the hub of activity for anything, from a concert to a car show to uh, you know whatever. It it happened at the Shrine Mosque, and it was an event center. It oh, was always yeah. an event center. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Um, any particular music acts that you went to see there that stand out in your mind? Mm. And preferably before 1985. Yeah. <laughs> uh, see, the thing that I remember more than anything is seeing the circus there. Uh -huh. Because as yeah. a kid, was that, was, that was just so, that was just impressed on me. Elvis would have been a little bit before you. Before my time, <laughs> yeah. yes. Elvis, yeah. <laughs> Saw him at, the, at Hammond's. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, 
Um, I was at the time when every, everything was kind of coming away from the shrine and going to McDonald Arena. So I saw like uh, uh, Fifth Dimension, right. the Association, all those people at, at McDonald. At McDonald. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, tell us, you, you were telling us a little bit before we started here about uh, some of the acts that you know of at the shrine. Talk about the impact of the shrine oh my goodness. as a club it, on Route 66. It, it, ex right. it, was the biggest, it was the biggest venue on Route 66, mm -hmm. from one end to the other. It, was, it seated more people. It would seat up to 4,000 in there. And so it was the biggest auditorium on Route 66, and everybody that was anybody played there over the course of time from 1923 when it opened until today, actually. Yeah, there's still things going on. Right. But uh, there, everybody from Duke Ellington to Louis Armstrong to uh, Fritz Chrysler, I mean, the, the whole broad spectrum of music from from uh, tremendous uh, symphonic orchestras to dance bands like Glenn Miller and uh, all the way to Elvis Presley on one end of the spectrum to the other. It was, they all they all wanted to be there and they all did. I, I took about 10 minutes uh, looking at newspapers and came up with a full page handwritten list of, right. of amazing, just very familiar names. And then they did uh, they did music shows there. KWTO radio was across the street, right. so it was very convenient for them to do live music right, over yes. there. Like Corns of Kraken was one of their shows that was a precursor to the uh, Ozark Jubilee. And so anything from country music to rock and roll to symphony to dance bands to African American entertainers of all kinds, everybody from Duke Ellington to Ella Fitzgerald. It, uh, it was extraordinary, the number of people that, that passed through those doors. Yeah, probably uh, brought more outside names than any other. Oh, absolutely. Venue. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. sure. Um, I want to ask, I know there are several others, but I want to ask about the Village Barn on, on college. Um, because we know that the Philharmonics played there. They, they were in, our, they were, um, I am right saying that right. It is the Village Barn, right? That's yeah. what I saw. On College Street. We have ads from... Village Barn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 408 oh, College. Yeah. yeah. The Philharmonics played there in the mid 50s. Um, Village Barn, 408. That is that close to the theater? You know, I don't know. Or is it close? Or is it? Um, It'd be on the south side of the street, in the second block off of the square. So it would have been uh, approximately where that uh, parking deck is. Uh, yeah, right, right. there. Don't remember that place? We have no. a we, in newspaper.com yeah. she brought up several ads. I thought you had told us about it. Uh-uh. Yeah. Village Barn. What was it? Because see that's uh that's right there where the fire station was. Uh, okay. and the jail, the police department. We have more than one one ad from the Village yeah. Barn. Yeah. 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 It's um it was a it was a happening place. Yeah. In what era? The fifties? Uh, yeah, it would have been in the fifties. Well, yeah. see as for yeah. my time. Yeah, right. Still. It was the I don't time. remember that one at all. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. That's all right. Um, any others before I ask him some wrap up questions? Well, maybe the, the townhouse you said was next to the shrine. Oh, the townhouse the was big. House. Yeah. Big. The townhouse was. Uh, it should have been right next to the shrine. Uh, well, yeah. it, was, it's, it was on Short Benton. Okay. Just off of where the bank is there, across from the Discovery Center. Okay. Uh, and it was funny because uh, that was the site of Calvary Presbyterian Church. And when First Presbyterian and Calvary Presbyterian merged, they tore that church down. But they had a new Sunday school building that had been built more recently than the church itself. It remained, and it became the townhouse lounge. About <laughs> that. <laughs> it was on the in the west on the west side of Benton Street, just north of of uh, St. Louis. Mm -hmm. There at Benton and St. Louis, and uh, it was a great place. Good bands, nice place, lots of fun, and it was an easy walk across their parking lot to the Little Chef, the all night diner, that was set up on St. Louis Street. So you could kind of stagger across their parking lot, try to get something to eat, to get yourself adapted enough to get back home. You just you just brought up. A question that I was going to ask with these venues mm -hmm. was it advantageous to other businesses besides entertainment venues to have those venues around like an all-night yeah, diner yeah hotels, absolutely oh my goodness yeah, yeah 
Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, did would you say that businesses around those places considered them an, an advantage more than a disadvantage because you got riff raff and yeah? I think I think it was yeah, it was a balancing act, but uh -huh. yeah, for the most part, I'd think so. Okay. And then later, the townhouse, they Urban Renewal took all that, and the townhouse moved out onto Glenstone. Onto Glenstone. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we had that too. Yeah. yeah. Do, what was, do, do you remember roughly when that happened? No. Okay. No, that was later on in the 80s, I think. Okay, all right. Um, was it important, I know we're running out of time, was it important to be fronted on Route 66 if you were one of these venues? Oh, early on, absolutely. Okay. Just from the, just from the, just from the amount of travel. Uh, yeah, it was, it was really important. So, so if you were a business on the downtown, like, um, the Regency, for instance, or, or, um, or some of these others that were located real close to the square, which was more important to be on Route 66 or to be on the, close to the square? I'd say on Route 66. Okay. Because close to the square, you got to think close to the square uh, of the, the, the things that were there was like inside a mall. It was all the businesses, Zales, Jewelers, and Sears, and Wards, and all those places were right there on the, just off the square. And, and it was more of a, um, a daylight, um, take your kids and go shopping kind of thing. But out on Route 66, those evening travelers and stuff like that, a mm -hmm. little more space to park, closer parking, uh, it was more convenient, uh, would make it better for them. So a little bit, a little bit out of way. Say like from the bus depot on out. Mm -hmm. You get inside the bus depot, you get into, you know, well, I'd like to go to the rendezvous, but there's no place to park. So, yeah. Yeah. So uh, an advantage being on Route 66 exactly. regardless. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Uh, we may come back to you for some follow-up questions. But Anytime. we certainly yeah. appreciate your time and your willingness to participate because you are extremely knowledgeable Happy. about this topic. Happy to do it. Thank you, John. Yep.